The second problem which had to be faced before stabilization was possible was the problem of inflation. This was caused by the great increase in claims on wealth, money, and showed itself in a drastic increase in prices. There were three possible solutions. A. To increase the production of real wealth. B. To decrease the quantity of money. And C. To devaluate or make each unit of money equal to a smaller amount of wealth, specifically gold. The first two would have forced prices back to the lower pre-war level, but would have done it in entirely different ways, one resulting in prosperity and the great rise in standards of living, the second resulting in depression and a great fall in standards of living. The third method, devaluation, was essentially a recognition and acceptance of the existing situation, and would have left prices at a higher post-war level permanently. This would have involved a permanent reduction in the value of money, and also would have given different parities in foreign exchanges, unless there was international agreement that countries devaluate by the same ratio but it would have made possible prosperity and a rising standard of living, and would have accepted as permanent the redistribution of wealth from creditors to debtors brought about by the wartime inflation. Since this third method, devaluation, was rejected by orthodox theorists, and no one could see how to get the first, increase of real wealth, only the second deflation was left as a possible method for dealing with the problem of inflation. To many people it seemed axiomatic that the cure for inflation was deflation, especially since bankers regarded deflation as a good thing in itself. Moreover, Deflation as a method for dealing with the problem of inflation went hand in hand with taxation as a method for dealing with the problem of public debt. Theorists did not stop to think what the effects of both would be on the production of real wealth and on the prosperity of the world. The third financial problem, which had to be solved before stabilization became practical, was the problem of price parities. This differed because it was primarily an international question, while the other two problems were primarily domestic. By suspending the gold standard and establishing artificial control of foreign exchanges at the outbreak of war, the belligerent countries made it possible for prices to rise at different rates in different countries. This can be seen in the fact that prices in Britain rose 200% in seven years, 1913-1920, to to while in the United States they rose only 100%. The resulting disequilibrium had to be rectified before the two countries went back to the old gold standard, or the currencies would be valued in law in a ratio quite different from their real value in goods. By going back on gold at the old ratios, one ounce of fine gold would, by law, become equal to twenty dollars and seven sixty seven cents in the United States and about eighty four shillings eleven and a half pence in Britain. For the twenty point sixty seven dollars in the United States you could get in 1920, about half of what you could have bought with it 
1930. For the 84 shillings, 11 and a half pence in Britain, you could get in 1920 only about a third of what it would buy in 1913. The ounce of gold in the United States would be much more valuable than in Britain, so that foreigners and British would prefer to buy in the United States rather than in Britain, and gold would tend to flow to the United States from Britain with goods flowing in the opposite direction. In such conditions, it would be said that the pound was overvalued and the dollar undervalued. The overvaluation would bring depression in Britain, while the United States would tend to be prosperous. Such disequilibrium of price parities could be adjusted either by a fall of prices in the country whose currency was overvalued, or by a rise in prices in the country whose currency was undervalued, or by both. Such an adjustment would be largely automatic, but at the cost of a considerable flow of gold from the country whose currency was overvalued. Because the problem of price parities would either adjust itself or would require international agreement for its adjustments, no real attention was paid to it when governments turned their attention to the task of stabilization. Instead, they concentrated on the other two problems and, above all, devoted attention to the task of building up sufficient gold reserves to permit them to carry out the methods chosen in respect to these two problems. Most countries were in a hurry to stabilize their currencies when peace was signed in 1919. The difficulties of the three problems we have mentioned made it necessary to postpone the step for years. The process of stabilization was stretched over more than a decade, from 1919 to 1931. Only the United States was able to return to the gold standard at once. And this was the result of a peculiar combination of circumstances which existed only in that country. The United States had a plentiful supply of gold. In addition, it had a technological structure quite different from that of any other country, except perhaps Japan. American technology was advancing so rapidly in the period 1922 to 1928 that even with falling prices there was prosperity, since costs of production fell even faster. This situation was helped by the fact that prices of raw materials and food fell faster than prices of industrial products, so that production of these latter was very profitable. As a result, America achieved to a degree greater than any other country a solution of inflation and public debt which all theorists had recognized as possible, but which none had known how to obtain the solution to be found in a great increase in real wealth. This increase made it possible simultaneously to pay off the public debt and reduce taxes. It also made it possible to have deflation without depression. A happier solution of the post-war problems could hardly have been found for a time at least. In the long run, the situation had its drawbacks, since the fact that costs fell faster than prices, and that prices of agricultural products and raw materials fell faster than prices of industrial products, 
meant that in the long run the community would not have sufficient purchasing power to buy the products of the industrial organization. This problem was postponed for a considerable period by the application of easy credit and installment selling to the domestic market and by the extension to foreign countries of huge loans which made it possible for these countries to buy the products of American industry without sending their own goods into the American market in return. Thus, for from a most unusual group of circumstances, the United States obtained an unusual boom of prosperity. These circumstances were, however, in many ways a postponement of difficulties rather than a solution to them, as the theoretical understanding of what was going on was still lacking. In other countries, the stabilization period was not so happy. In Britain, stabilization was reached by orthodox path, that is, taxation as a cure for public debt and deflation as a cure for inflation. These cures were believed necessary in order to go back to the, on the old gold parity. Since Britain did not have an adequate supply of gold, the policy of deflation had to be pushed ruthlessly in order to reduce the volume of money in circulation to a quantity small enough to be superimposed on the small base of available gold at the old ratios. At the same time, the policy was intended to drive British prices down to the level of world prices. The currency notes which had been used to supplement banknotes, were retired. And credit was curtailed by raising the discount rate to panic level. The results were horrible. Business activity fell drastically, and unemployment rose to well over a million and a half. The drastic, the drastic fall in prices from 1307 in 1920 to 197 in 1921 made production unprofitable unless costs were driven down even faster. This could not be achieved because labor unions were determined that a burden of the deflationary policy should not be pushed onto them by forcing down wages. The outcome was a great wave of strikes and industrial unrest. The British government could measure the success of their deflation only by comparing their price level with world price levels. This was done by means of the exchange ratio between the pound and the dollar. At that time, the dollar was the only important currency on gold. It was Expected that the forcing down of prices in Britain would be reflected in an increase in the value of the pound in terms of dollars on the foreign exchange market. Thus, as the pound rose gradually upward toward the pre-war rate of $4.86, this rise would measure the fall in British prices downward to the American or the world price level. In general terms, this was true, but it failed to take into consideration the speculators who, knowing that the value of the pound was rising, sold dollars to buy pounds, thus pushing the dollar down and the pound upward faster than was justified in terms of the changes in price levels in the two countries. <clears throat> thus the pound rose to four dollars and 86 cents, while the British price level had not yet fallen to the American price level. But the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Winston Churchill, judging the price level by the exchange rate, believed that it had and went back on the gold standard at that point. As a result, sterling was overvalued 
and Britain found itself economically isolated on a price plateau above the world market on which she was economically dependent. These higher British prices served to increase imports, decrease exports, and encourage an outflow of gold, which made gold reserves dangerously low. To maintain the gold reserve at all, it was necessary to keep the discount rate at a level so high, 4.5% or more, that business activity was discouraged. The only solution which the British government could see to this situation was continued deflation. This effort to drive down prices failed because the unions were able to prevent the dr drastic cutting of costs, chiefly wages, necessary to permit profitable production on such a deflationary market. Nor could the alternative method of deflation by heavy taxation be imposed on the necessary degree to the necessary degree on the upper classes who were in control of the government. The showdown on the deflationary policy came in the general strike of nineteen twenty six. The unions lost the strike, that is, they could not prevent the prevent the policy of deflation, but they made it impossible for the government <coughs> to continue the reduction of costs <coughs> to the extent necessary to restore business profits and the export trade. As a result of this financial policy, Britain found herself faced with deflation and depression for the whole period 1920 to 1933. These effects were drastic in 1920 to 1922, moderate in 1922 to 1929, and drastic again in 1929 to 1933. The wholesale price index, 19, with 1930-13 equaling 100, fell from 307 in 1920 to 197 in 1921, then declined slowly to 137 in 1928. Then it fell rapidly to 120 in 1929 and 90 in 1933. The number of unemployed averaged about uh, one uh, and three quarter millions for each of the 13 years of 1921 to 1932 and reached 3 million in 1931. At the same time, the inadequacy of the British gold reserve during most of the period placed Britain in financial subjection to France, which had a plentiful supply of gold because of her different financial policy. This subjection served to balance the political subjection of France to Britain arising from French insecurity and ended only with Britain's abandonment of the gold standard in 1931. Britain was the only important European country which reached stabilization through deflation. East of her, a second group of countries, including Belgium, France and Italy, reached stabilization through devaluation. This was a far better method. It was adopted, however, not because of superior intelligence, but because of financial weakness. In these countries, the burden of war damage reconstruction made it impossible to balance a budget, and this made deflation difficult. These countries accepted orthodox financial ideas and tried to deflate in 1920-21, but after the depression which resulted, they gave up the task. Belgium stabilized, once at 107 francs to the pound sterling, but could not hold this level and had to devaluate further to 175 francs to the pound, October 1926. France stabilized at 124.21 francs to the pound, 
at the end of 1926, although the stabilization was made de jure only in June 1928. Italy stabilized at 92.946 lire to the pound sterling in December 1927.